and uh, and I'm so um, pleased to also um, have Dean Bryan with us. And Dean Bryan, I wanted to just ask if you might like to say um, uh, something about the um, the Honors Colloquium series, um, which has uh, provided funding for today's event. Sure, thank you and welcome everybody. Um, I'm really happy that we can provide this event, especially with our esteemed speaker today. The Honors Colloquium was recently established as a, a way for the faculty to uh, select speakers to bring to campus or virtual, whether it's virtual or in-person. Uh, it is funded by the Lewis Honors College. And so we're really pleased that um, we're hosting our event today. Thank, thank you, Dr. Cena, for making this happen. Thank you, Dean Bryan. Um, and we're so thankful to the, the Honors College for providing funding. So I wanted to um, welcome our distinguished guest, Dr. Patrick Curry is a, a scholar um, from the UK, not UK, um, London, England, not London, Kentucky. Um, we are uh, so grateful to have him virtually visiting with us today. Um, his scholarship uh, in, encompasses um, a variety of, of areas that are, I think, all very, very interesting. Um, and, and pertinent. Um, and to, uh, I first encountered Dr. Curry's work um, in his Tolkien scholarship, in his text, Defending Middle Earth, Tolkien Myth and Modernity, um, and was just very powerfully moved by it. And um, so I am so grateful for uh, his um, agreeing to uh, visit with us today and, and share about um, the Lord of the Rings and re-enchantment. So without further ado, Dr. Curry. Thank you. Well, it's very, very nice to be here, and I, I want to thank uh, everybody who made it possible in one way or another for it to happen. Um, a few years ago, I was invited to address the question, is the Lord of the Rings a great book at the Bodleian Library in Oxford? But rather than answer it directly, I insisted that what was important was to keep a space open for the question as a perfectly legitimate question to ask. That's quite clever, I thought to myself. And I'm in Oxford. What could go wrong? Well, as they say here, too clever by half. Nobody in the audience was satisfied, no matter which answer they preferred. So today I'm just going to say it. Yes, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings is a great book. It certainly fulfills David Foster Wallace's criterion, quote, in dark times, the definition of good art would seem to be art that locates and applies CPR to those elements of what's human and magical that still live and glow despite the time's darkness. I think we can tick that box. More specifically in this context, I think it's a great book because it can be powerfully enchanting for readers. So let me tell you why and what that might mean for us now in terms of re-enchantment. But for now, all I, all I want to do is point out, well, first I want to point out that I borrowed the idea of re-enchantment from a famous speech, almost a prophecy, delivered just over a century ago by the social philosopher Max Weber. Quote, the fate of our times is defined by rationalization and intellectualization, and above all, by the disenchantment of the world. End quote. So before turning to Tolkien directly, I'd like to try and give you a basic sense of enchantment, what, it, what the term means in the first place, for you to keep somewhere in mind as we proceed. Fundamentally, it means the experience of wonder. It varies in intensity from charm through delight to joy. And in the last case, which I call deep enchantment, it can be life-changing. Its contrary, which partly defines it, and vice versa, is will, as in the will to power, say, power and knowledge, and any sort, any form of agenda. Enchantment is relational. It happens as an encounter across a gap of differences, which it instantly bridges, an encounter with an enchanting other. This other party, can be literally anything or anyone, certainly doesn't have to be a human being. But whoever the other turns out to be, whether another human or a different kind of animal, 
or a place or a work of art or an idea, they become in effect a person, another person with agency and subjectivity of, of their own. As you can imagine, this experience is quite challenging to some powerful traditional, mostly religious and modern, mostly secular orthodoxies. So it often doesn't get talked about much in public. By the same token, Weber dis defined enchantment as concrete magic. And what he meant by that was that it is always both material, even carnal, embodied, very specifically situated, and spiritual, deeply mysterious. It's both, which again makes enchantment problematic in relation to the two dominant metaphysical camps of our time, scientific materialists on the one hand and romantic supernaturalists on the other. Much as these two detest each other, they tacitly agree that you can carve up the world that way and reduce one truth to the other. Enchantment resists that whole process, and when it cannot resist it, it dies. What else? Since enchantment is a fun of relationship, and since relationship is not under the complete control of either party, or else it isn't one, enchantment, like relationship, is essentially wild. It can be invited, but not ordered, or controlled, or managed. When it happens, it does so as a gift. Finally, enchantment, like love, only forever while it lasts. Time radically slows when it happens but not completely. And eventually the very slowly swirling eddy in the pool rejoins the swiftly flowing stream of time and is swept away. For that reason, it often has an undertow of melancholy. It's always passing. And the fact that it always might return isn't always much consolation. Okay, what follows then is my account of a book enchanting readers, including me. But its real interest lies in questions like, why does it enchant readers? What are its readers hungry for? How does the book return them to the world and is exactly the same world afterwards? I myself read The Lord of the Rings more than 50 years ago. I don't like these numbers, but there they are. Uh, when I was 16. It was very like falling in love, but not like falling into a dream, more like waking up. Or to change metaphors again, I devoured the story, famished for something in it that I apparently wasn't finding anywhere else. For a long while, I was living more in Middle Earth, and it meant more to me than where I merely happened to be located at the time, which was in upstate New York. It's an open question, I think, whether or not it is still possible to read Tolkien quite as I did. Certainly it's difficult now to imagine the excitement of discovering this book for oneself in the company of a very few contemporaries. Readers of Tolkien then felt a secret affinity. We were the lucky few, living among the unknowing many. Of course, one's critical faculties are underdeveloped at that age. But Tolkien's epic has sustained me through countless rereadings since then, and each time I emerge not only renewed, but having learned something, whether from a bit I'd never really noticed before, or from a new reflection provoked by what I thought I knew well. The Lord of the Rings now, in my house, shares shelf space with, say, Proust's In Search of Lost Time, another quest narrative, by the way, and Ford Maddox Ford's Parade's End, another war epic, but it does so on equal terms. For those who've been living on a different literary planet, Tolkien's tale centers on hobbits, a literally little people of his own invention, with hairy feet and simple tastes, supplemented by humans and several other species, elves, dwarves, orcs, and wizards, not to mention sentient trees, 
each with their own culture and language and home place. There are also some memorable characters, not least Gollum, a study in addiction, who is surely Tolkien's contribution to any enduring 20th century literary cast. The story is set in Middle-earth, a, a world both like and unlike our own, featuring an extraordinary array of forests, mountains, and rivers, each with their own personalities. The narrative follows a quest, not to find something, but to get rid of something, a toxic ring of power. It finally succeeds, albeit at grievous cost. And along the way, stirring set pieces Set-piece battles alternate with sojourns in distinctly uh, peaceful or powerful places, thus creating a rolling narrative rhythm, which I'm sorry to say was completely lost in Peter Jackson's films. Let me give you an instance of each kind. Here's the Hobbit Merry on his way to the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. He sat for a moment half dreaming, listening to the noise of the water a whisper of dark trees, the crack of stone, and the vast waiting silence that brooded behind all sound. He loved mountains, or he had loved the thought of them marching away on the edges of stories brought from far away, but now he was borne down by the insupportable weight of Middle Earth. He longed to shut out the immensity in a quiet room by a fire. And in that, ba end quote, and in that battle, just when the Lord of the Nazca who is about to enter the sh shattered gates of the city, his victory all but complete. Quote, in that very moment, away behind in some courtyard of the city, a cock crowed. Shrill and clear he crowed, wrecking nothing of wizardry or war, welcoming only the morning that in the sky, far above the shadows of death, was coming with the dawn. As if in answer there came from far away another note, horns, horns, horns. Great horns of the north wildly blowing, Rohan had come at last. Ooh, glad I got through that. <laughs> Without you know, cracking the voice. Um, right, the story itself is almost equally strange in a modern context. Despite its contents, the contents of the stories, sheer unlikeliness, there are no lawyers, no detectives, no lone serial killers, no anguished middle-class metropolitans, or even any sex. Plus the fact that it runs to more than a thousand pages, The Lord of the Rings has a good claim to be the best-selling work of fiction ever. The best available estimate of sales figures since its publication in 1955-56, in English alone, is about 200 million copies. And sales show no sign of declining. The implication is clear. However odd its contents are in mainstream terms, Tolkien is feeding some considerable hunger, which is nonetheless largely unacknowledged by cultural leaders. In polls of readers, in 1996, through an Amazon poll the following year, to one of three quarters of a million readers in 2003, The Lord of the Rings has consistently placed first. More recently, the exhibition of Tolkien's art at the Bodleian Library in Oxford broke all their attendance records, as did the same exhibition in New York and Paris. And then of course, there were the movies, all hugely popular, whatever their merits or lack thereof. This overwhelming pop popular success has been accompanied by almost comical critical dismay. Tolkien has had some able defenders, no notably W.H. Auden and Ursula Le Guin, but the dominant tone among critics was set by Edmund Wilson, who attacked, believe it or not, its poverty of invention. And Philip Toynbee, who was spectacular in prescience, declared in 1961 that the books have now passed into a merciful, merciful oblivion. It continued, this, this tone continued at the hands of various critics through to the reaction to those polls who, whose outcomes were described as a nightmare by Germaine Greer and horrifying by the Times Literary Supplement. In the London Review of Books, Jenny Turner described Tolkien's art as, quote, an infantile comfort that is also a black pit. 
I think this might say more about her than it does about the book. Today, Philip Pullman is still at it in fatuous comments that I won't dignify with a response here. The other book that tended to come up tops, albeit second, was Orwell's 1984. This actually makes sense. Although one book is by a socialist and the other a conservative, small c, the authors of both were equally worried about where modernity is headed. And that, I think, is one reason for Tolkien's success. The world he presents consists of three nested spheres which are perhaps the most important sources of enchantment in our lives. Community, the Shire, which is the communal home of the hobbits. Secondly, nature, the natural world of Middle Earth. And thirdly, the, the, uh, uh, the encircling spirit, uh, sorry, the encircling sea, which I think symbolizes uh, inexhaustible spiritual values. When the story opens, all three of them are, are under severe threat from the Lord of the Rings himself, Sauron, the most powerful magician and technologist in Middle-earth and the master of disenchantment. As Tolkien knew well, the words magic and machine come from the same Indo-European root, asterisk M-A-G-H, meaning to have power. Mordor is the only modern state in Middle-earth, albeit pathologically so. It has an advanced industrial economy, mass surveillance and bureaucracy, a huge military force, and an aggressive imperialist foreign policy. How familiar that all sounds. In all three respects then, communities, the natural world, and spiritual values, readers find their fears addressed and taken seriously. And they take heart from the fact that in the end, those values survive, although not without grievous losses. The threat is lifted at the end, if only just, and thanks to an unforeseeable act of grace centered on the unlikely character of Gollum. Tom Shippey has observed that Tolkien's concerns about power are distinctively modern, putting him in the company of George Orwell, William Golding, and Kurt Vonnegut. But Tolkien himself was deeply anti-modern, along the lines of John Ruskin and G.K. Chesterton. And his books are deliberately not modern. They are not modern novels. They make no concession to either of the two modern gods whom theism has had to share metaphysical rulership since the 17th century, psychology on the one hand, and physics, more recently neurophysiology, on the other. Tolkien was learned beyond the dreams of most fantasy writers, yet he chose to turn his back on the self-conscious, preferably ironic, modern, modernist literary novel and write as if that had never happened. For the literati, the fact that the reading public loved the result made it all the more unforgivable, but it also confirmed their opinion of him. Except for Mordor, Middle-earth too is non-modern, a Europe that was never Europeanized, so to speak. Self-organized communities are the dominant political form. Nature is not a set of resources, but alive and even sentient in all its parts. And spiritual values, looking over the sea to the west, home of the gods and ultimately the elves, are respected and honored. Unsurprisingly, given that Tolkien was a staunch Catholic, the Lord of the Rings gives pride of place to the virtues of pity and mercy. But these exist alongside the equally important pagan virtue of courage, which Tolkien took from his deep study of Beowulf and the pre-Christian cultures of Northwest Europe. Another important thing to understand about Tolkien and his work, however, is that he was above all an artist. He did what storytellers do, take what they need, combine it with something else that fits, and come up with something new, even if its roots are ancient. So in actual post-Roman Europe, the Holy Roman Empire and Byzantium remained forever sundered. But in Middle-earth, the kingdoms of Gondor and Arnor, after many centuries, are reunited. The riders of Rohan are, from our modern point of view, a mixture of Goths and Anglo-Saxons, 
but Tolkien put them on horseback. The Jewish diaspora was given to the dwarves. His two elvish languages were inspired by Finnish and Welsh, and so on. Not surprisingly then, Tolkien decries allegory, whereby one thing, the ring, say, is really and only another thing, nuclear power, say. But he defends applicability, which he describes as freedom of the reader to find stories relevant to their own thought and experience and come up with new meanings. And there are plenty of opportunities for readers who want to do that. For example, Tolkien draws a sharp distinction between magic as the exercise of power and enchantment, the experience of disinterested and non-possessive wonder which, for which his name was fairy. Tolkien had an abiding concern with wonder, both in life and art, and its absence, along with any equivalent of the elves, marks an important difference between his work and most other contemporary fantasy. As it happens, for what it's worth, the elves affected me particularly strongly. Beginning with the first one we encounter, Gildor, but then full-blown with the appearance of Glorfindel, I felt as if I were encountering a dear but long-lost friend, whom I hadn't expected to meet again, indeed had almost forgotten. Tolkien's elves are deliberately exemplars of enchantment, but I didn't need to know that to feel it. They are a world away from Shakespearean or Victorian whimsy. But I think most readers would agree that the chapter on Lothlorien, the heart of Elvendom in Middle-earth, is one of the book's most powerful. A little excerpt for an uh, uh, extraordinary presentation of what happens to time in Deep Enchantment. At Frodo's first encounter with Lothlorien, quote, it seemed to him he had stepped over a bridge of time into a corner of the elder days and was now walking in a world that was no more. Frodo stood still, hearing far off great seas upon beaches that had long ago been washed away, and seabirds crying whose race had perished from the earth. And and he sees Galadriel, Lorien's embodiment, as, quote, present and yet remote, a living vision of that which has already been left far behind by the flowing streams of time. Ultimately, though, it seems that fairy is at the mercy of power. The One Ring and its single vision, to borrow a very useful term from William Blake, trumps the Three Rings of Enchantment. But there is another issue still deeper than power in Tolkien's work. In his own words, death and the desire for deathlessness. That desire leads to mistaking what he called limitless serial longevity, living on and on and on and on, for immortality, which lies, if anywhere, on the other side of death. The ring thus confers the power to go on apparently living forever, until life becomes an endless weariness, and those in its grip, preeminently the ring race, crave death as much as they fear it. But the ring cannot give true immortality. And all we humans have to set against what Tolkien called the hideous peril of that confusion is hope without guarantees. In this respect, he is much more of a realist and less of a fantasist than many modernists and than all transhumanists. These themes and concerns are woven into the fabric of Tolkien's tale, and there are others. I haven't mentioned yet his passionate love of trees and his prescient fears for the destruction of wild nature by industrial society. Today's news on the Guardian website 3% of the world's fundamental ecosystems are still intact, 3%. These concerns are directly reflected in Tolkien's fictional forests, each one unique, not one of them merely a generic stage set for the main human interest. And by the same token, his ends 
are not human beings in tree form, but trees who happen to be fully sentient. And Middle Earth itself is not so much a setting as a character in its own right. Rainer Unwin, who first published The Lord of the Rings, summed it up with inimitable pith as, quote, a very great book in its own curious way, end quote. This does not mean it's perfect, of course, whatever that might exactly mean. Tolkien's style usually rises to the occasion, but it's not always adequate to his epic's range. Sometimes it lapses into sentimentality or woodenness, and its occasional archaism, even when appropriate, will never be to everyone's taste. Tolkien was no misogynist, and his tale doesn't lack strong female characters, Galadriel, Eowyn, Arwen, and for that matter, Lobelia Sackville Baggins and Shelob. But Middle-earth is dominated by men, even when an independent woman such as Eowyn chafes against it. On the other hand, the charge that sex is missing is true, but to call that disabling is absurd. Moby Dick, or James Joyce's short stories, or P.G. Woodhouse. Something which virtually all his readers recognize is the book's deeply melancholic undertow. By the end, it is clear that even though the ring has been destroyed, <clears throat> Elrond's initial conjecture was correct. Quote, many fair things will fade and be forgotten. End quote. Indeed, it appears that for Tolkien, the best that is on offer in this world is, quote, a sadness without bitterness. Yet I have noticed that many of his readers emerged from reading the book or rereading it feeling renewed as I do. That is probably why rereading The Lord of the Rings, no matter how familiar with it one may be, is so frequent. I think it's a case of what one writer, Fraser Harrison, calls radical nostalgia. Not a fuzzy disabling indulgence, but an empowering reminder of what we live, what we love community, nature, spirit, which encourages us to value and protect them. After all, Tolkien's story doesn't end over the sea, somewhere else, but here in Middle-earth. The last words of the book are Sam's, well, I'm back. In this sense, I guess my early response to the reading the book was true. The Lord of the Rings doesn't cast a dreamlike spell on us. Rather, us, rather, I think it awakens us from the deathly spell of modernist disenchantment and lassitude, recently electronic. Okay, let's see where we are. I hope I've made a plausible case for the greatness of the Lord of the Rings in its own strange way. Its popular success cannot be doubted. And if we combine those two points, oddness and success, we are left with this question, what is it about the book which so many people want, but which most cultural, literary, and academic critics don't get? I made a start earlier in answering that, pointing to the way readers' fears about the trajectory of modernity and its triple threat are addressed within the story. So Tolkien's tale partly works as a deep critique of aspects of the modern world and certainly of the project of modernity. And within the story, that threat is averted, albeit barely, so readers are again left with hope without guarantees, which these days is already quite something. What do I mean by modernity? The most important single point is encapsulated, I think, in the ecofeminist philosopher Val Plumwood's summary of the defining project of modernity. What it seeks above all, she says, is, quote, the rational mastery of nature, end quote, including human nature. Now, rational mastery requires bringing everything under one single and undisputed rule. And what does that remind us of? Something soul, shiny, and round. There cannot be exceptions or other truths, even other kinds of truth, 
because that would imperil the possibility of complete mastery. And if it isn't complete in its own view, then it's failed. To put it another way, the program of modernity requires the disenchantment of the world. Why? Because what the experience of wonder shows us, partly revealing it and partly creating it, is the intrinsic value of the enchanting other, no matter who or what they are. Ultimately, says Tolkien, enchantment is, quote, a love and respect for all things, animate and inanimate, an unpossessive love of them as other, not what they are to us or for us. Continuing the quote, things seen in its light will be respected and they will also appear delightful, beautiful, wondrous, even glorious, end quote. And he added that this fairy is as necessary, and I'm quoting again, as necessary for the health and complete functioning of the human as is sunlight for physical life, end quote. Disenchantment recognizes only instrumental value for realizing some other purpose. Often, if not usually, power over others, although often again described as a higher purpose or an ultimate purpose. Of course, that is how the wizard Saruman tries to justify his treacherous collaboration with Sauron, holding out to Gandalf the prospect of knowledge, rule, order. Relatedly, disenchantment prizes exchange value in the marketplace. Its conflation of the marketplace with rationality as a whole is something that neoliberalism is only the latest ideology to uphold. In the sharpest possible contrast to unique and incommensurable intrinsic values, the modernist ideal is, and here I'm quoting Horkheimer and Adorno from the Dialectic of Enlightenment, quote, the system from which everything and anything follows, which can therefore be predicted manipulated and controlled. What's not to like? Enchantment thus interferes with the project of modernity, which is why executing that project requires its extirpation. Thoroughly, systematically disenchanted people with no ultimate values to protect will have no way to resist being mastered. None of that messy, awkward, embarrassing nonsense from little people of hands off or not for sale or you don't speak for us. And of course, this is why Tolkien was so deeply unpopular and still is among modernists. Because this project is exactly what the Lord of the Rings calls into radical question. It encourages and inspires people to value really being alive, to feeling alive, and what that entails, relationships with all kinds of other beings, human and otherwise, and therefore ethics, because if you're in a relationship with another subject, you're responsible for your effects on them. So ethics are right there from the beginning. And the precious value of our only home, which gave us all birth, the earth, and the places where and the moments when our eyes are opened in love, in art of all kinds, in religion, in learning, in nature, and the felt intuitive existence of an intangible dimension of lived life which cannot be calculated and exploited. Let's call it the spirit. Although what I'm talking about when I say spirit, pervades and suffuses our sensuous bodily existence without in the least impugning it or opposing it. Although I want to add, not all enchantments have to be high elven ones. Don't despise good food and drink and convivial company. The hobbits certainly didn't. In all these respects then, the world doesn't actually need re-enchanting. The world, as Chesterton observes, quote, will never starve for want of wonders, 
but only for want of wonder, end quote. It's us who need reminding to keep the door open to its wonders and to honor and protect them. So perhaps enchantment, the possibility of at least, does have the last word. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Curry. Um, and we will have time for questions. So have your questions um, armed and at the ready um, uh, to fire away at Dr. Curry. Um, I wanted to um, take just an another minute um, uh, here to um, acknowledge um, some other special guests that we have um, on the call today. So um, special thanks to uh, Linda and Martha who are um, also um, here. Um, and we're so thankful to them, especially for um, f their formation of the uh, Crabtree Cornell Fund for the Environment. Um, which funded uh, Dr. Curry's guest lecture in um, Honors 301 yesterday, um, and so is is partial partially um, supporting his um, his visit with our our, our college um, yesterday and today. So we're we're very grateful for um, their uh, commitment to um, the environment and to supporting um, the interaction of, of University of Kentucky students and especially Lewis Honors College students with um, sustainability and the environment. Um, and so we'll take questions. Does anybody have any questions um, for Dr. Curry? Feel free to unmute yourself and ask them or you can um, type them in the chat. Oh, Dr. Curry, I'll, I'll ask a question. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. I, I was interested at when you first started talking about how the people in on both sides weren't happy with your presentation last time you gave it. Right. Uh, but I mean, you could talk maybe some about why people weren't satisfied by that, or I'm thinking sort of particularly like, is there like a limited number of great books? And is that why people are like, well, no, my books are the great books. The, the the You know, there's sort of, or do, is, is there an unlimited number? Um, feel free to take up either one of those. Thank you. Well, okay. Mm, I'm tempted to cop out by saying I'm not a literary critic as such, but I'll try not to do that. Um, I think the audience was composed in what, the, what proportions, I don't know, of people who are, who are convinced that they're already convinced that The Lord of the Rings is a great book and people who are firmly of the opinion that it, that it isn't. So by dodging the question, they were both annoyed at me. Um, whereas if I'd answered it, only half of them, so to speak, would have been. Um, I think it's when, when I'm aware that um, the term great book is, oh, wow, is that a loaded term uh, in literary studies, quite rightly, because uh, what gets considered a, a great book is, uh, heavily laden with uh, power considerations of all kinds, um, class, gender, etc. So you have to be very careful with it. So I am using the term loosely and, um, and I think it's important to qualify. I, I did actually qualify it by saying a great book in its own way, in its own peculiar way. I have no problem with calling it a peculiar book. I mean, it is by any standard. It's not a novel, for example. It, I don't know what it is exactly. Perhaps epic comes close, to, but it's radically unfashionable in any case. So I don't have a problem with calling it a great book it, for that reason. And, and also because, well, it's popularity. It's spoken to, to so many people so deeply and, and it did to me. So I can always, if necessary, take shelter and say, hey, uh, it's a great book for me. Um, no doubt about it. Um, and uh, is there an unlimited supply of great books? I, 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 I imagine so. I imagine so. Yeah. Um, I can't construct a, an argument, uh, a set of criteria for what constitute really great books. I love that quotation by David Foster Wallace. 
because I think that's an important part of it. And a great book for anyone in their own experience, of course, will be simply one that they keep coming back to and finding new things in. And The Lord of the Rings certainly does that for me. So that's probably the best I can give. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, there's another question in the chat, and I'll read that. Um, so um, Dr. Kirshner asks, how, how do you think or how well do you think Tolkien manages to bring his considerable audience back into wonder, into appreciating the world of enchantment? What does he do to bring modern readers back into contact with the natural world in ways that might alter their previous interaction or future engagement? Well, to take the second part of that question first, um, I think, uh, <laughs> and I talked about this yesterday to some extent, um, the, the remarkable thing about the natural world is um, in, in, in the Lord of the Rings, um, that is to say Middle Earth, is that it's not a setting for, it's not anthropocentric. It's not a setting for human beings. Uh, a setting by definition is secondary to the more important or most important thing, whatever that is, usually us, okay, in a book. Well, the Lord of the Rings is not anthropocentric and the natural world in the Lord of the Rings um, is a world of many often conflicting, sometimes cohering subjectivities, non-human subjectivities with their own agendas and their own interests. Uh, the mountain that doesn't want those people to cross it, thank you very much. The forest that is angry about human beings and tries to stamp them out. The forest that is friendly to them, et cetera, et cetera. So you're, you're, you're dealing with a, a non-anthropocentric or if you prefer an ecocentric living, living natural world, okay? Not living in a biological or technical sense, but living in, a, in an experiential animistic sense, okay? That's kind of a shock. We don't usually encounter, uh, until perhaps recently, we, re, by we, I mean modern readers, haven't encountered that sort of thing before. So my conjecture, for which I can offer absolutely no proof whatsoever, is that deeply buried in all of us is a memory trace, if you like, of living in that kind of world or living in that kind of relationship to nature, which frankly, for most of the hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years that we have been human beings in our present anatomical and physiological form, that was the kind of world we lived in. It was alive and therefore often dangerous, but it was also wondrous. Well, I think Tolkien's book triggers a memory of that. It's like a reminder. It's like a uh, sort of like, hey, wake up, um, look out, look around, go outside and see what's really happening. It's not all about you. It is alive. Well, that's a, a fantastic service because I, a further conjecture of mine is that without enough people having personal experience of the wonder of the natural world in whatever respects that it speaks to them as, um, without some degree, some minimum degree of that, all the policies, the political policies, all the scientific programs, all the well-intentioned stuff, it ain't going to work. It ain't going to fly. Because ultimately, and I think it was Stephen Jay Gould who said this, but other people have said it as well, you'll only really put yourself on the line to defend. You will only stand up for what you love. And if you remember Tolkien's definition of enchantment is, non-possessive love of the other as other, not as reflected glory for us, but as itself. And I think his work, I really do think his work moves readers in that direction. That's awesome. Thanks, um, Daniel, for the question. And thanks so much um, for the answer, Dr. Curry. Um, other questions? We've got time for one or maybe two questions. Um, I'll ask one um, that's maybe a little spicy. I have a question. Who are you to the studies that you have 
experienced over the years? Well, if you look at my website, you'll see a fantastically eclectic bunch of things that I've studied. And for, for a certain percent of the, a certain portion of the arc of my studies, I managed to find a way to study them academically, or at least in universities. Um, uh, you'll find the history of astrology. Uh, you'll find divination, uh, this, trying to understand uh, divination. Uh, you'll find enchantment. You find a lot of ecology more recently. And I have asked myself, what's the common thread here? I'm um, not absolutely sure there is one, but I think there is. And basically I've been looking for ways to think because I do love thinking. And I don't think thinking itself is a problem at all because you thinking is a practice. It's no more necessarily a problem than say cooking is or skydiving or you know whatever it's a practice and so i was looking for ways to think about uh these things that interested me that modernity that that modern sort of per perspectives and points of view didn't want to know about and couldn't handle and 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 if they came into contact with astrology or with divination, or with wonder, even with wonder, or with Tolkien. They go, oh, no, 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 I'm sorry, we can't, we can't go there. Well, I was looking for a way to go there. And since I would find a little bit here in this philosopher, say Wittgenstein, or I'd find some in Tolkien, or I'd find some in poetry, I think, you know, poetry is tremendously important to me. I think it's, it, poets actually know more about enchantment than probably any other job description. Um, I was looking for that and finding bits here and there. And so I decided to try and put them together into a somewhat coherent way to think about this stuff that since I couldn't find an entire coherence, I had to create it myself. And I think that's basically how it came about. There certainly wasn't an agenda. And actually, I don't recommend it as a career move either. <laughs> Thank you. And were you, uh, as a child, were you interested in thinking as well? Or when did you discover this, this love, this passion? I spent an awful long, awful lot of time as a child in my head. Partly because that's what I like doing and partly because the so-called outside world I found very threatening and intimidating and I, and, and I wasn't really coping with it very well. Um, so as part of that time that I spent in my head, I devoured a lot of, uh, I had my head in a book a lot of the, a lot of the time. I had an Anglophone mother, so I read a tremendous lot of, you know, Ed Edwardian and later uh, children's uh, li literature, which is, uh, in which wonder figures very strongly, obviously. Um, read The Hobbit when I was nine, and then when I discovered Lord of the Rings, I started reading and went, oh my God, this is the same place. <laughs> that, was, that was fun. Um, so um, I think it was a question to wind up answering your, your question. I think it was a matter of me finally finding a way to do something with positive and constructive and creative above all with who I was anyway. And I think an awful lot of problems would be easier if people could really get to grips with and be honest with themselves about who they are, the kind of person they are, their temperament, their abilities, their limitations, and so on, and ask, what can I do with this in the world that will help the world? And then you can set about trying to build a career around that. Um, that's the order. I think. Actually, you know, the poet Robert Frost said something amazing. He said in poetry, poetry begins with delight and ends in wisdom. He didn't say it the other way around. It doesn't start with wisdom. It starts with delight and then you end up hopefully with wisdom. I think that's the right order. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? I might ask a final question that might be a little um, a little spicy. Um, so, Dr. Curry, you you kind of mentioned a couple times that you um, you take issue with the the films to some extent, and 
Um, I I could certainly concur, um, and and my students in in our class, you know, we we kind of talk about that sometimes. Yeah. Um, but my question is, um, what would you say, maybe if, um, for folks whose only experience of Tolkien is Peter Jackson's films? Um, right. Is there a is there maybe a, a something about um, wonder or enchantment that you would say that they're mi they're missing, and you would say they really need to to go and read um, to recapture? You mentioned a little bit earlier um, about um, some of the things that maybe Jackson doesn't hit as much as far as the the agency of nature. Okay, I want to be careful about what I say about the films because I have. You know, I've met people, as we all have, who were really enchanted by those films. So, so do you mind if I call them films? It's just a habit, because I live here. Um, um, really enchanted by them. So I have absolutely no desire to trash their enchantment. <laughs> um, at the same time, I can't help feeling, uh, and also I, do, I have no desire to tell them what to do, but I would, I think, urge them, hey, have you tried reading the books? You might enjoy the books, and they're probably going to be a slightly different experience than the films, okay? Um, in my experience, it's very unusual for a film to translate, for a book to translate well into a movie. Um, John Huston pulled it off with his, um, James Joyce's short story, The Dead. A Danish filmmaker pulled it off with Karen Blixen's Babette's Feast. Quite unusual though. Tolkien himself says about stage, you know, about theater. In his opinion, he said, it's inherently anthropocentric. He actually said, you can't get anything interesting about a tree as a tree into a play. It's gonna be about the humans. So that would be already a limitation that Peter Jackson would be working within. However, I do find, uh, I, I sense that, um, and I'm, this is sheer speculation, but you know, Jackson seemed to have a slightly macho attitude to this stuff. Like, okay, yeah, Tolkien's a great storyteller, but I'm not going to be pushed around by him. And if I feel like doing this, I'm changing this. I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. But I, I couldn't help but noticing that every, almost every time he changes something, it's not an improvement. I mean, Tolkien was a master storyteller. For God's sake, that's what he was good at. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, um, he, Jackson didn't maintain the rhythm. There's a battle and then there's a peaceful scene and then there's a struggle and then there's a, ref, a solace and refuge. Well, it's all at the level of, it's 100% full on the whole time. Well, I think you've lost something important there. So I'm glad that the f movies have introduce the books potentially to a lot of people. There's, I have no complaints about that. And if you want to enjoy the films, of course, that's absolutely fine. But I think there's these other things you could find in the books. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I should also say, I do also really enjoy the, the films and will probably continue to Good. watch them every year for the rest of my life or something. But fine. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I, I thank you for, for that answer. Sure. Um, we are just about out of time, so I, I will invite us to thank our speaker one more time. Thank um, and thanks again to the Honors Colloquium Fund um, yep. and to the Crabtree Cornell Fund for the Environment. We're so thankful for your support. Um, and thank you, Dr. Curry, for visiting with us. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it and um, blessings to you all. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.